Very happy to hear about that situation. And it sounds like my final question to you is going forward, it would be a very productive idea and we'd be properly representing the people of this state in all communities, including communities who have been dealing with this for a lot longer than uh, perhaps other communities. Communities that were, are represented where their concerned voices of those representatives have been telling us that those issues have gone um, unaddressed for, for decades. All of our communities and all of our families and children would be so better off if we push forward to even improve upon this legislation after it's passed, work on better funding in the budget, provide more beds, increase the, the uh, number of programs, find the best practices of, for education and the deterrence, and even include law enforcement at some stage of the process, and that the solution is the, the tapestry that occurs when we put all these pieces together and we continue to work on them even after we pass the wonderful bills of today. Well, the, I do want to say that at least insofar as uh, involuntary treatment proposals have been made, I'm not satisfied that uh, my colleagues who represent the districts that you're referring to have been adequately consulted. And I think that's one of the reasons that this body has not moved forward on that legislation. With respect to police officers, I want to commend the police officers and the firefighters who do have to go through the process of re reviving these uh, addicts with Narcan. However, I want to point out that I am not in support of any further criminal legislation. We have ample penalties on all of these issues, and I, I think that to the extent, and I know our sheriff has been extremely active in Albany County in trying to assist with the treatment process rather than a criminalization process. Sounds as though you would be in favor of an ideology that would make, uh, uh, make it easier for police officers to cut down on the number of incidences. None of us want them. We're happy that they, they will have more Narcan, and, and I'd love to see uh, the state, not the counties, the, not the municipalities, but the state pay for uh, the cost to make sure those medications are in every squad car, in every location, but all of the pieces to this puzzle, because these are wonderful bills, and we can go home proud when we report to the families that we have listened to them and we've done a lot. But I think we are in all, all in agreement that we need to do more to strengthen even the bill we'll be voting for, and I certainly look forward to voting for this bill today and the other bills, but that we can do more to strengthen them, make them better, and to provide the funding that the families, the treatment centers, the hospitals, and even the police and fire departments need to take on and be more successful in the task. Well, I certainly agree me, uh, more needs to be done, and I'll be very much looking forward to how we figure out the, how to raise the revenue to do that. We'll be looking for your support on that issue. Thank you for your time and answering my questions on the bill. On the bill. Again, there are so many families who are watching and listening for the results to give them hope. And I want to thank everybody in this room and in the Senate and the governor's office who continues to work toward finding the solutions and providing the hope for these families so that we can protect the health of their children, the health of, of those involved in this terrible epidemic, and that if and God forbid when their loved ones are involved in addiction, that the treatments are available, the beds are available, and that we have the best practices in place. So we are no longer the leader, and uh, it's one of those problems in the community I serve, the highest number of addictions in Suffolk County, the highest number of deaths. We spoke about the crime and as it relates to the uh, shootings, w w one in Medford, another in Seaford, and in a drugstore owned by one of my constituents. It just, it just continues to go. But having the resolve 
of good people like the sponsors of these bills, like those who have led in the, in the fight to bring attention to and, and to bring the issues and the solutions to the floor, will continue to show that it comes down to two words, we care. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Saladino. Read the last section. This act shall take effect immediately. The clerk will record the vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kearns to explain his vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today and uh, I want to give you some numbers. 128, 201, 570. No, that's not the number of bills we passed over the past three days, unfortunately. But th that's the number of deaths. In 2014, 128 in Erie County. In 2015, it was 201. And this year, we're projected to have over 570 deaths. That's 10, 10 deaths a week with the average person 38 years old. So I commend the sponsors. We need more data collection. Uh, we need to take on this crisis. But it's interesting and it's funny. Big Pharma started this, and our drug dealers look different. They're wearing white coats. They're driving Mercedes. No one's going to jail. Our big banks, no one's going to jail. There's a common theme here. So I, a previous sponsor talked about seeing this movie. This burgeoning epidemic, this scourge on our community has to change. This is a, a good start. The governor started this winter a program under the New York, New York Constitution where the state has an obligation to provide aid, care, and to support under the mental health hygiene law. We need to help save people if they can't save themselves. I'm sick of going to funerals of young men and young women who have beautiful kids and who care about them and they're dying. This is something important and we need to do something about it. With that, I vote in the affirmative. Mr. Kearns in the affirmative. Ms. Rosenthal to explain her vote. Uh, to, to explain my vote. Despite the importance of what we have accomplished today, <clears throat> we cannot rest. These bills are but a first step in our ongoing efforts to stem overdose deaths. Our fight must continue until not one more family struggles with the loss of a loved one to heroin or opioids, and we must ensure we continue to expand access to medication-assisted treatment and pri prioritize harm reduction over coercive measures. We must also continue to invest heavily in prevention, education, and treatment and recovery support statewide, as well as implement restorative justice for the generation of youth who were thrown in jail and forgotten. I would like to thank the following groups and people who have made our attention to this epidemic possible. ASAP, Drug Policy Alliance, COMPA, Vocal New York, Friends of Recovery, Addiction Treatment Providers Association, NYU Medical Center Residents, Kids Escaping Drugs, ACT UP, Truth Farm, The Safe Foundation, Seneca Nation, New York City Bar Association, Thomas's Hope, Save the Michaels of the World and Avi Israel, Families Together, Camelot, NYCLU Legal Action Center, Coalition for Community Services, Supportive Housing Network of New York, Wendy Blanchard, Rx Diary, Center to Advance Palliative Care, End of Life Choices, New York, and of course all my colleagues, the members of the Committee on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, my colleagues from around the state who care so much about this, the fabulous staff of uh, the Committee on Alcoholism who uh, shepherded through um, a lot of what I, I wanted, uh, as well as the speaker for appointing me to the committee as the chair so I could represent this body, and I was proud to do it. I vote in the affirmative. Ms. Rosenthal in the affirmative. Mr. Lopez to explain his vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to explain my vote. You know, certainly, as we've heard from our colleagues, this crisis, a plague, if you would, uh, is not limited to inner cities. It's not limited to suburbs. It's uh, in the countryside. It's in the hills, in the forests, hidden from view. And we know that outside of the suffering of the individuals who are personally affected, that there's collateral damage. 
that there are family members, community members who also uh, join in some capacity in the, in the damage that's being done uh, throughout the state. These bills, and I, I'm very, very thankful for the efforts that have gone into producing this legislative packet of these three bills, and recognizing, as was noted by uh, the previous speaker, my colleague, chairwoman of the, com of the uh, committee, that this is really the beginning, and we must continue to focus on all aspects, so crisis management, counseling, rehabilitation, and ultimately, we do have to have a thoughtful discussion about interdiction. How do we control supply, and how do we prevent uh, this, these damaging drugs from getting in the hands uh, of those people who are becoming victimized and ultimately suffering uh, from this plague? So I'm very pleased to be part of this body today as we work to ease the suffering of our neighbors across the state. I withdraw my request and vote in the affirmative. Mr. Lopez in the affirmative. Mr. Blake to explain his vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just to briefly explain my vote, I, I absolutely do acknowledge there is a need to do more uh, to help uh, communities that are struggling with this continual epidemic, one that has existed for uh, not just a few weeks or months, but for decades. Uh, but I, I do have concern, especially among communities of color, uh, around Part D, which would be uh, holding someone for an additional day, uh, 72 hours, creates more challenge than, than true promise. It does not clearly convey that there's a medical rationale of that being the exact needed time. Uh, what you realistically hear is that if someone needs more time, it's more in the two weeks. Uh, so holding communities of color and other individuals for a long period of time is something that I'm always uncomfortable with. Uh, and I think that's very problematic precedents that we have to be concerned about. Uh, I do recognize and appreciate Member Steck uh, for this bill. I, I think the intent of it collectively is positive, uh, but whenever we are holding communities longer, uh, uh, philosophically have opposition to that. And for, and for that reason, that reason alone, I'll be voting in the negative. Thank you. Mr. Blake in the negative. Are there any other votes? Mr. Levine to explain his vote. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, like uh, many in this room, and I suspect like far too many families that may be watching this, um, uh, I've had some, uh, perhaps too much experience with um, uh, loved ones uh, who struggle with, uh, with addiction. And it strikes me that among families that are in despair and suffering anxiety, were they to watch our debate, I think they would they would readily realize that everyone here is passionate about trying to help. But if they would watch what some of us are saying, I think they should bear in mind, we are legislators. We are not experts in this. We are not experts in, in the health field. And I think that those who watch should watch and not mistake um, passion uh, for knowledge. But I think those who watch should realize that we are beginning to move in another direction uh, as a legislature, and this is true not only in New York, but in other places, other states as well. We're beginning to move where we should have moved long ago to a therapeutic approach. Now, this may or may not work, and I'll be the first to say I don't know the answer to this crisis when it comes to treating individuals who are suffering from it. But I think that anyone who's watching should, if they get any impression from what we are doing and what we're saying, we are trying to help, we're trying to move in the right direction, and we are all in this together. I'm very pleased that we're advancing these bills and moving towards a therapeutic method of treatment, a public health method of treatment, and I'm withdrawing my request and I'm voting in the affirmative. Thank you. Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Eyes 107, noes 2. The bill is passed. Mr. Morelli. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. If we could now go to Rules Report 511 on page 20 of the main calendar by Mr. Pretlow. 
Clerk will read. Assembly 10,736, Rules Report 511, Committee on Rules, an act to amend the Racing Paramutual Wagering and Breeding Law. An explanation is requested, Mr. Pretlow. Uh, certainly, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I would like to say, first of all, that this bill is a touchdown. And I'm surrounded by my team here, and we're going to huddle from time to time. But um, in late uh, 2015, the Attorney General of the state of New York um, had some questions about the, Ill, the legality of certain um, enterprises operating in the state of New York. Um, basically, well, they were uh, fantasy sports operations. Um, the two most notable ones are FanDuel and, and DraftKings. Um, as a result of the inquiry that the Attorney General um, did, we on the, um, way, on the uh, Racing and Wagering Committee held a public hearing and did extensive research into the operations of fantasy sports. And we came to the determination that fantasy sports is not gambling and does not therefore violate any uh, sections of the New York State Constitution. We also decided that because there were entry fees involved and monies involved that the state uh, should regulate um, these enterprises. And what this legislation does is actually provides for the registration, regulation, and taxation of all online fantasy simulated sports games or contests that have an entry fee in the state of New York. The bill also establishes safeguards and minimum standards uh, to provide players with important consumer protections. It prohibits people under the age of 18 from participating. It prohibits athletes, sports agents, team employees, referees, league officials, as well as members, officers, and employees and agents of the operators of these platforms to participate. Um, it enables players to exclude themselves from contests and permanently close their accounts at any time. And it establishes a process for accepting and investigating consumer complaints. The financial aspects of the bill is that it imposes a 15% tax on each registrant's interactive uh, fantasy sports gross revenue and an additional one half of 1% on each registrant's interactive gross revenue not to exceed $50,000 annually. It authorizes the New York State Gaming Commission to uh, conduct financial audits of, audits of any registrant at any time, and it directs that all funds collected um, through or from these fantasy sports operations be directed to the New York State Lottery to be sent uh, to our education funds. Question. Mr. Goodell. Thank you, Speaker. Would the sponsor yield? Will you yield, Mr. Pretlow? Absolutely. Good. Mr. Pretlow yields, Mr. Goodell. Can we try and raise the house? We want some voice today. Uh, I'll try. Do the best you can. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pretlow. I appreciate uh, allowing me to ask some questions. Uh, as you know, uh, the New York State Attorney General, Eric Schneiderman, uh, brought an action with a cease and desist order, followed up by a lawsuit seeking uh, an injunction against these fancy sports activities. <clears throat> and when he did, he said, quote, fantasy sports are the leaders of a massive multi-billion dollar scheme to evade the law and fleece sports fans across the country. He also said that these fantasy sports programs were, quote, seriously misleading New York citizens about their prospects of winning. And uh, he said this program is, quote, creating the same public health and economic problems associated with gambling. Now, you've had a public hearing on that, and based on that public hearing, 
Is it your belief that our Attorney General was mistaken? The Attorney General um, asked the legislature to look at this, and we did, or we did based on our own volition, and we came to the conclusion, uh, based on the facts that we had garnered, that this, in fact, is not um, a violation of the penal code. It is not gambling and, therefore, not unconstitutional. Um, did you evaluate, though, his pretty strong language about being a multi-million dollar scheme to fleece New Yorkers. Did you come oh. to the conclusion that that was not correct? Mr. Goodell, because someone uses pretty strong language doesn't make it correct. And, and I'm inquiring whether you came to the conclusion that that language was incorrect. Yes. Well, if you look at the definition of gambling, gambling is defined in Section uh, 225 of the Penal Code as the staking or risking of something of value upon the outcome or consent or of, of a contest of chance or future contingent event not under a person's control or influence upon the agreement and understanding of a person who will receive something of value in the event of a certain income. And you're referring to outcome, the I mean. definition of gambling that's contained in the current penal law? Yes, that's the definition that's in the current penal law. And of course, uh, our Constitution itself deals with gambling and prohibits gambling with certain exceptions, correct? Yes. And uh, would you agree with me that whether or not this constitutes gambling is an issue that ultimately will be decided by the courts and not the legislature? Well, it depends if the uh, court case that's um, pending right now does not go through, then it, there may be a, a lawsuit in the future. Um, but by virtue of this um, piece of legislation we have in front of us right now, um, deeming that this activity is not gambling, uh, the court case that this would be moot. But you would agree with me, right, that the legislature does not have the power uh, by statute to redefine the words in the Constitution in a way that the constitutional framers or the public understood them at the time they were enacted. I agree with you 100 percent that we cannot rewrite the Constitution by legislation. But as legislators, we are the creators of the law. And we, we write the law, and under that guise, we define what is legal and not legal, and the legislative findings in this legislation are that this is not gambling, therefore not subject to the provisions of the Constitution. Well, I know that uh, Nevada, which certainly has a long uh, career in evaluating gambling, uh, Nevada has rule that this is gambling. I, I know other states, Tennessee, Texas, Illinois. Are you aware of any other states that have ruled that it is well, not many, gambling? Many other states have ruled it not gambling, and I have a list here. I'm going to huddle. That have, not, that have said it's not gambling are Colorado, Indiana, Kansas, Tennessee, Michigan, Massachusetts, Mississippi, Rhode Island, and Virginia. Uh, no. I try to go on. I have another you can list just give me of that, pending the legislation. No, Mr. Mr. Goodell, to tell you the truth, many of these states are looking to see what New York does, and they're going to follow in our footsteps. Indeed, many of these states made the determination it was gambling after our, our own attorney general came to that conclusion. Uh, no doubt uh, they're watching us. <clears throat> um, in terms of the exceptions under the Constitution, we're both in agreement that this itself, on its face, wouldn't fall within any of those exceptions, right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah. Uh, the New York State Constitution prohibits gambling. Yes. And then has certain exceptions, lottery, horse racing, uh, things of that nature. Yes. We're all clear that this wouldn't fall within any of those exceptions if it is it otherwise is not one of those gambling. exceptions. But it doesn't need to be one of those exceptions. It is on, the, on its own face, not gambling. <clears throat> now, you indicate that this is more a game of skill rather than a game of chance. And yes. That's the basis for your belief it's not gambling? Yes. Well, you would agree with me, would you, that... That total skill. I'm sorry? But isn't a number of... Uh, Activities that we all agree are gambling involve also a high degree of skill. I mean, certainly 
was a high degree of skill involved in poker. I, I can assure you, having just dabbled in it and lost my nickels or quarters or whatever, I mean, there's certainly a high degree of skill in poker, yet we all agree that's gambling. But we're not looking at poker now, we're looking at interactive fantasy sports. I might point out, uh, even though it's against my own argument, that those playing against me were not gambling. That was a sure thing. But uh, for, for people of equal skill, uh, and likewise, um, as a chair of racing and wagering, of course, you know that horse racing involves a lot of skill for those who are in it uh, professionally. I mean, they evaluate the horse, track conditions, temperatures, humidity, trends, jockeys, when it ran, and they're all provided with a massive amount of data that they analyze provided by the tracks and others. Well, I, I agree with you, Mr. Goodell, but the horse race has been around since the, um, the, the, the 1800s. And back then, we didn't have the differentiation in laws between skill and chance. So when the Constitution of the State of New York was written, horse racing was included as gambling. If horse racing were to be invented today, it probably wouldn't fall under the gambling. That's very interesting because clearly the constitutional framers considered it gambling because they expressly excluded it from the scope of the constitutional prohibition against gambling. And they wouldn't have excluded it if they hadn't considered it gambling. Well, I'm not sure when horse racing was added to the Constitution as something to be excluded or, or permissible under a New York state law. But I could, you do know that back in the 19... I, I could give you that answer, but it's probably not worth looking up, right? <laughs> you can look anything up. You, it was, uh, we have these fancy the things 40s, on our desk now. You brought that out yesterday. Now, what I thought was interesting about your bill is that it first declares that fantasy sports is not gambling, and then, if I'm correct, imposes almost all the regulatory oversight that we normally impose on gambling, including requirements for notice about compulsory gambling and the problems with it. Uh, we put it under the Gaming Commission, whose sole responsibility is to regulate gambling, or one of its primary responsibilities, I should say. We have the funds going to education just like we do with the lottery, which we all agree is a form of uh, gambling. We restrict the age to 18, which is the same type of age restriction we have on gambling. We prohibit certain people who have a conflict of interest from engaging it, just like we do in other situations involving gambling, like in horse racing. I mean, obviously, jockeys and trainers are not allowed to bet on horse racing for obvious reasons. Is there any provision in your bill uh, that, I, let me put it differently, are there any other restrictions or protections we have the general public that we impose on gambling operations that are not included in your bill? Well, first of all, it's, it's compulsive playing, not compulsive gambling. Uh, thank you. I mean, if you read uh, but are there other and protections that we normally have for the public on gambling activities? Well, the individuals, that's not included in the individuals bill? that play this game were subject to um, the rules as based on the creators, I'll use FanDuel and, and DraftKings as an example, but there are like 20 or 30 others um, that are, are in the business. And we figured that three and a half million New Yorkers uh, wanted to participate um, in these games, um, that there should be some way for the state to oversee it. And since you no know, money was being involved, we also felt that there should be uh, some tax associated with it, and that's where we got the 50% of the gross revenues. Uh, by the way, I agree on that objective, on both objectives. Uh, do we have a sense of how many people play the lottery? I, I, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. We, but we, it's certainly we, more than 3.5 million, right? Absolutely more than 3.5 million. And yet the fact that millions and millions and millions of New Yorkers play the lottery, we still agree that lottery is gambling, isn't it? Well, lottery, lottery is, is total chance. You have no, no control over anything uh, when you play the lottery. You pick and numbers, that, you buy a scratch off, you don't know what it is. So, yes, sure, and, and people who play in, in fantasy sports, they don't have any direct control over how the individual players play. I mean, they, they can control which players are part of their team, but 
they don't have any direct control over how any of those players but play. But they have direct control as to who goes on or who is part of their roster. Um, Mr. Goodell, this is more like a, 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 a class or a course in business. You know, you are the general manager of a team, and you're allocated a salary cap. You get $50,000 for a salary cap. And there are hundreds of players that you can pick from to build your team. The skill is to actually find the worst performing player, which is, comes to you the cheapest, that performs the best within a period of time. It's usually, it's, it's a week, we know, for a football thing. You know, so there is a skill involved in picking um, a team. If you pick the most expensive quarterback, you're not going to have enough you know, money left to, and this is all fake money. This is fantasy money. We're not talking real dollars. You're not going to have I try to remind my wife of real left. dollars when she's shopping, not fantasy dollars, but, but well, I no, appreciate the, 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 it. Most people at bet, they, if it's the younger, they, they bet around $5 a game. They're not betting the hundreds of dollars. Uh, you find you the more skillful players that bet the hundreds of dollars. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Pretlow. I appreciate your comments. On the bill? On the bill, Mr. Goodell. Um, just as a way of introduction, in, in my family, uh, there are some members of my family that know an awful lot about some sports, like football and uh, might be extraordinarily capable at playing not only the game in real life, but fantasy sports. Uh, I don't fall in that category. Uh, whatever limited skill I might have apparently was inherited by others. Um, so our, our state constitution is actually remarkably clear on gambling, and it's put right in the front of the, of the state constitution, and it says uh, not only does it prohibit gambling, but it goes on to say you can't have, it says no law shall allow lottery, lottery tickets, pool selling, book making, quote, or any other kind of gambling. Any other kind of gambling. Now, the Constitution doesn't say, except for gambling that involves a little bit of skill, it says any other kind of gambling. Now, we as a legislature don't have the legal authority to pass a law that says poker is not gambling. We can't do that. It's up to the courts to define what was meant by gambling, and they've been pretty successful at it. We can't say poker's okay. We can't say casino gambling's okay. You know, we had to pass a constitutional amendment, or the voters did, to allow that. And by the way, we can't say that any other type of gambling is okay. This is one of the only provisions in the state constitution, by the way, that goes on with a specific direction to the legislature itself. The constitutional language goes on to say, and the legislature shall pass appropriate laws to prevent offenses against any of the provisions of this section. That's kind of wild. So I find myself in an interesting dilemma, and I'm sure many of you do as well. In my mind, this is clearly gambling. It's just like any other type of sports gambling. But if it is gambling, I think we ought to regulate it. Therein lies the conundrum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Goodell. Mr. Murray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to speak on the bill. On the bill, sir. So um, first, let me say that uh, for full disclosure, um, I uh, have been playing fantasy sports season long for quite some time and daily sports. Uh, I am a DraftKings account holder and I enjoy it uh, uh, quite a bit. And the reason I wanted to speak today was I wanted to share with my colleagues uh, some thoughts about how the game is played, uh, because I think there is a misconception. Uh, it's easy to say from a general standpoint, it's gambling. But when you, when you get into the weeds and into the details, I can show why we believe it is a game of skill more than a game of chance. Let me start here. As was mentioned earlier, the Attorney General brought this up in the fall of last year. One of his concerns was that he felt that 
the uh, radio commercials uh, were misleading, and we were misleading the public on, on how this was done and whether you could win. Well, first he attacked the DraftKings and FanDuel commercials, claiming they were seriously misleading New York citizens about their prospects of winning. Now, that's kind of ironic, coming from the state that runs lotto commercials with the tagline, lotto, making more New Yorkers rich than any other game. Of course, nowhere in those lottery commercials does it ever mention that your odds of winning the jackpot are extremely slim. In fact, it goes on to suggest that winning is quite easy. Uh, but for some reason, the attorney general and the opponents seem to think those aren't misleading. So we'll move on now to the other arguments regarding the attorney general said that the season-long fantasy games were fine, but the daily games are not. Uh, apparently, the Attorney General has never played fantasy football, you see, because they're virtually the same. The NFL games are played weekly, so there's very little difference between the season-long and the daily games because the daily games are played on a weekly basis. So in those games, the rosters are changed on a weekly basis. So in the season-long games, players can be dropped, picked up, traded at any time, uh, because of injuries, bye weeks, or their performance. The rosters are adjusted and changed every week. But that's exactly what's done in the daily games, too. Every week, the rosters are adjusted. So it's virtually the exact same thing. So if you're saying the season long for football is okay, I don't see how you say the daily one isn't okay because they're played virtually the same way. Now, over the past week, there's been lobbyists and, and all of these naysayers that have been coming forward with this Trojan horse theory. So if we allow this, it's going to be the end of casinos in the state. It's going to be the end of, of horse racing tracks and everything else. People will lose their jobs. Oh, the tragedy. Here's the thing. This isn't new. We've been playing daily fantasy sports and season-long fantasy sports in the state of New York for years, nearly a decade. The subject only came up last year when the commercials started running and it grabbed some people's attention. And they said, hey, why aren't we getting a cut on this? Why aren't we regulating this? That's the only reason this came up. But we've been playing this in the state of New York for years. So the Trojan horse theory goes right out the window. We've not closed casinos or shut down tracks or anything like that. There haven't been job losses. We've been playing this game for years. So let's move on and get to the crux of the skill versus chance theory. So let me start by saying this. When you're playing fantasy sports, knowledge is your skill, as the sponsor had mentioned several times. That's your skill. The more research you do, the more knowledgeable that you are about the sports, the teams, the players, the more skillfully you'll play the game. And as a result, I believe there's no question that you'll have a much better chance of winning. Such is also the case in day trading. In my opinion, daily fantasy sports is nothing but day trading for sports fans. Let me give you the comparison. In day trading, you open an account with companies like Scott Trade or TD Ameritrade. In daily fantasy sports, you'll open an account with DraftKings or FanDuel. In day trading, you deposit money into your account, just as you do in daily fantasy sports. In day trading, you purchase securities or stocks in companies while in daily fantasy sports, you're purchasing the players or the teams that'll serve on your roster. Day traders either make money or lose money based on the short-term performance of their stocks or securities that they purchase. In daily fantasy sports contests, win or lose, the win or lose based on the short-term performance, meaning one game of the players or the teams. So in both scenarios, the companies, Scott Trade and TD Ameritrade, or in the case of fantasy sports, DraftKings and FanDuel, they make their money on fees on transactions or participation, not on performance. Let me say that again, because that's very important, because we've heard all oh, this is nothing but bookies. No, bookies make their money on how you do as well. But this, they make their money on fees, on transactions or participation, not on performance. But there's no question that experience and knowledge play a tremendous role in whether or not a day trader or a daily fantasy sports player is successful. So I suggest to you that if we're going to be saying that daily fantasy sports is gambling because there's chance involved, 
then I think we need to call day trading what it is too. Because as I've expressed, it's virtually played the same way. You're doing the same thing. So are we gonna cut out day trading in the state of New York? Are we gonna call that and label that gambling and stop it? I don't think we wanna kill an entire industry by doing that. And finally, the Attorney General and many opponents have brought up the points that they were concerned that a small number or percentage of players were winning most of the pots. About the numbers I've heard was less than 5% of the players were winning about 75 to 80% of the pot. Well, I think they just made my point. So either the Attorney General or we've identified about 5% of the most unbelievably lucky people in the world, or they're skilled. They're very skilled in doing this, which is why they win most of the time. So once again, I submit to you that this is, there is a lot of skill involved in playing. So I'll close by saying this. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, just congratulate the sponsor on this. Uh, Gary's been very, very patient, uh, has worked very diligently in trying to listen to all sides and craft what I think is a very good bill. It offers up consumer protections and oversight while also generating revenue, uh, and that revenue will be going to education. I think it's a benefit for all. This is a win for the literally millions of fans in the state of New York that play and enjoy fantasy sports. It's also a win, though, for the state in that we will be generating millions of dollars that will be going towards education. So again, I would urge my colleagues to consider these facts when casting your vote today. Uh, I believe we should pass this bill. I again want to thank the sponsor, Mr. Pretlow, for his hard work. I'd like to also uh, thank the minority ranker on racing and wagering, Mr. Garbarino, for his hard work on this as well. And I have to say this as well. I want to thank all of you, and especially the speaker, because the last time I tried to speak out on this publicly, I had somebody screaming and yelling over me and turning my mic down. So I appreciate the fact that I actually got to get my point out this time. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Abernathy.